We have over 30,000 downloads of this app. Do y'all know how crazy that is? What we want to do with those 30,000 downloads to get those subs up. Y'all got Disney. Y'all got Hulu. Y'all got all these other things. And all we asking for is $10 a month or $120 a year. We can bring people out of hiding into a place of safety and stability so that through their vulnerability, they could heal and allow God to reveal what he wants to do in their life. Like this is... This is why we exist. We're going on a live tour. No dates have been revealed yet, but let me say that when we go on our live tour, y'all that haven't subscribed yet, do not be mad. Y'all showing preferential pr treatment. No, this is this is what we give B-siders. Like B-siders get this. The B-side app is waiting for you to come home. Peace. Yeah, I learned the game from Charles and Maxie, you can never tax me Back to back for the pastor that didn't even ask me Back to back like I am the brother with equal blessings Back to back like I'm GE 9697, whoa I wanna see my dwellers really change That's the reason for switching my freaking lane Now I'm potting, still saying Yeshua's name Some of y'all hoping that Timmy will go away It's two years later, homie, where y'all at? Sat up on my couch and made a B-side app I'm not sure what it was that really made that happen, but this is what I gotta do, it really made God clap, I mean, whoa. I am your host, Tim Ross. I love you guys very much. I hope you're all doing well. I want to get into uh, a, a conversation with my guest. I have been talking about her so much that y'all have been like literally screaming in the live chats you have been screaming on our premieres get her here just get her here stop talking about her just get her here if i'm dude we okay we get it where is she who is she well she's here oh i'm so happy because this is my sister y'all y'all gotta understand this is literally my sister from another mister yeah i love her so much uh we are in the same executive coaching group uh -huh. And um, uh, I can't say enough about this woman. She is uh, a brilliant mind, Thank you. beautiful person, inside and out. Um, I call her affectionately Captain Marvel. Uh -huh. I think she is like one of the most powerful people in the universe. Um, strong woman, loves God. Um, and she's also a sex therapist. You've been hearing me say a bunch of stuff and y'all been trying to get mad at me as if <laughs> I don't have context to the stuff I'm talking about. And now my friend is here. And if you got offended with me, you're going to hate her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I love her and I'm so grateful to introduce to some and present to others. My sissy. Are y'all ready? Y'all give it up for Jenna Mountain! Oh, Woo! Y'all are great. Yeah! <laughs> I am so excited to you be here. You are finally here! I know! I'm so excited. You've been talking trash about this for a minute. Well, listen, I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I wanted you here uh, for a myriad of reasons. And um, I just first want to say how much I appreciate you as a person. Like you, literally knowing you has been such a blessing to me and my life is better because you're in it I, and I don't want to live my life without you. Same. You're my sister and I'm so grateful you're here. Same. You're stuck with me. I will fight anybody. Yeah. On any block. Yeah. In any city, <laughs> in any state. I believe you. On That's any continent. Okay. I will. I believe you. Yeah, absolutely. I really do. Whether the gun laws are loose or strict, <laughs> I will show up. I will pull up to I fight. I do. I do. I feel that love well, genuinely. Hey, well, listen, Jenna, you're here. And um, listen, I could I could go straight to sex. Oh, I know. I mean, I could go straight there, <laughs> but that just feels wrong, right? Like, I, I just feel like... I feel like I, you've done that move before. I have done that move okay. before. I have done that before. Okay. Yes, I have done that before. I could go straight to sex. Um, and, uh, I, there's so much, there's so much that that's in your head that, that you could give us, but I just want our audience to have context to you. Okay. I love just starting with having context to you. So, mm -hmm. so would you just share with us who you are, where you're from yeah. and how you got to where you are? Oh my goodness. That was open-ended. It was. 
That means you get to you get to jump in there wherever you want. Yeah, I get to flavor that how I want to. Yeah, um, absolutely. So in our coaching process, I've had a really fun few years just getting to know myself. Mm-hmm. Um, this The next layers, which you and I fully embrace that we are in an ever ongoing developmental process. So there are two phrases that have... I don't know. I've developed. God's laid on my heart. I could use a lot of ways to to say that, I guess. But um, to describe myself professionally mm-hmm. that have come up and uh, over the last few years, um, one of them is I am passionate about building exponential healing systems. And um, I actually recently went through sort of a marketing branding process uh, for for some stuff with somebody. And she's like, I think people are going to get really stuck on the word exponential. (laughs) And we literally sat there and noodled on it for like 30 minutes trying to find a better word that really captured my heart. Um, And we couldn't find one. So I'm just going to be a marketing faux pas and keep exponential. Keep it. Because I love the way it means to the nth power. And so Mm. I like impacting systems more more than one person can start with the person um that the healing effect ripples out yeah is what i'm trying to say yeah, and so sure. i'm really passionate about that i love working with organizations i love working with individuals i love working with families couples yeah um but my heart is to teach a man to fish in their healing process so that they can go out and teach somebody else to fish to teach somebody else to fish and there's this ripple effect of healing so that's probably one big professional statement to describe my heart and passion and the way God's wired me. Yeah. And then um, the other one is a little bit more functional, which is I am a trauma informed relationship and sex expert, yep. but I am a relationship informed trauma expert. And I don't always think those go back and forth that way. And so when I talk about any human dynamics or uh, patterns or ideas. I'm really trying to take all of those things into account. And I don't know if everybody does that. So I, I, th- I think that that is a part of the voice I bring to the, to the professional space. Yeah. Uh, on a personal level, um, I do as I say. So I am in like you, yep. which is why you are so near and dear to me. Um, I'm in, I've done counseling. I'm not just a therapist. I've I've also been in therapy. Um, I offer coaching, but I'm also in coaching. Yep, absolutely. And I'm in a forever process. Yeah, me too. I think on this side of eternity, we're just always uh, kind of moving in the right direction, hopefully, but we're not done. Yeah, for sure. And so if I can't claim to be done or arrived, then I'm constantly in process. So I, I do the things I say. Yep. Um, I am happily married. Hey, come yes. through. Come through happily married. Um, I, I tell everybody he's the saint that I would occasionally like to kill. Hey. Um, he really is. He's the most amazing man yeah. ever. Um, and uh, we actually will be celebrating 15 years. Let's go, 15. This next summer. Let's yes. go. That's awesome. Yes. So, and we have two delightful children. We were just talking about my son. They are very delightful. They, they are unusually they, delightful. They are yummy. Yes. And delightful. I can't even take credit. I mean, I'm a good mom. And my husband, again, is this incredible father. But, like, I look at them and I'm like, we can't even take credit for that. They are (laughs) unusually well behaved. And they have really unique, special things about them. And we were just talking about my son. He is just funny. He's he's built different. Yeah, he's built completely different. He really is. Prescott is a different person. He begged to wear a suit to school today. Because he's a G. Because he, yeah. No, he really is. This, he really this dude, is. <laughs> this dude, this dude is wearing suits to school in kindergarten. In kindergarten on Mondays. Yes. Homie is built different. He's he's built different. <laughs> he's built di- and he and he has to feel different. Yeah. Right. Because when you look good, you feel good. So yeah. Prescott is. I don't know. Prescott going to be the CEO of something by the time I he's know. eleven. I, I don't know. know. He might he's graduate just... from, from from college by the time he's ten. He's so great. And my daughter is this artistic, creative, delightful soul that I just can't wait to see what God does with her. So um, married, have a family, um, small business owner. So I own a group whoop practice whoop. in Richardson. Let's go women owning small yes. businesses. Let's go <laughs> Captain Marvel. So uh, Aspen House Associates where uh-huh. I serve as a therapist and a coach. 
and do some consulting. So that's that's the nutshell. Uh, I would like to say uh, I am I, I can be unbiased and say this honestly that I am a client of Aspen House. Uh, I do see one of the therapists there. It's not you because no. we're friends. We're buddies. We're buddies, so we can't have black market therapy going on. No. Um, it's, and like, it's a thing. It is a thing. Uh, so I am uh, a, a part of uh, the clientele that frequents Aspen House. That's where all my EMDR work is done, and I have grown exponent. I mean, you can testify to it. I have grown exponentially oh, yeah. since the you're the one that actually told me to do EMDR. I wasn't going to say that. Yo, no, you, you did. I you're did. the, you, you challenged me. It, you challenged me to do it. It was our yearly wrap up. That's exactly right. At the end of the year. It, or no, it was midway because affirmations and challenges. It was, I thought it was year of in so was it mid it was mid year, year. okay so let me uh, okay Last year. let's explain this okay yeah, yeah. so so in our executive coaching group we have um oh this is the first time i hear sirens coming by yeah yeah this is a safe neighborhood though i promise you <laughs> somebody probably fell ill because i know it wasn't shots fired <laughs> not in denton nobody's coming straight out of denton <laughs> except graduates of UNT. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, so let me give you context to this. So, uh, Jen and I are in this executive coaching group midway through the year. And, uh, at the end of the year we do affirmations and challenges yeah. and, um, we give, we, we give basically progress reports on each other. Yeah. But in the best way, it, like in the best way, whatever you think of a progress report, think 10 times better than that. I want to so, jump in real quick. Cause yeah. I think this is important. The, the way these, and, I'm, and I know, I feel very confident that not all coaches are created equal, but the way the good coaching cohort groups are built, there is a level of safety Correct. that's built in the relational and group dynamic that it's so hard to capture with words. Yes, so when you say we gave each other progress reports, that probably right. sounds terrifying to a lot of people. Yeah, that's true. But let's texture that. This is one of the safest best experiences it you can do it is oh my goodness the level of vulnerability in there yeah. Pe people are like surprised by the vulnerability on this podcast and have no idea yeah. like yeah when we're in that room this is like it's normal e it's exponential, it is exponential. <laughs> our level of vulnerability is exponential all right so we're doing uh, affirmations and challenges and jenna is the one that goes because she's walked with me through this journey of my healing and all this kind of stuff. And she goes, dude, I know you got some things, you got some things that are trapped in your body. They're trapped in your neural system. Yep. And I promise you, and she was almost like finger pointing at me. She was so <laughs> passionate about it. She was like, Ooh, if you were to just get some EMDR, Oh my goodness, it would be so well for you. You need to do it. And I was like, okay, girl. Like, I mean, calm down. I mean, I will. <laughs> so, you don't have to keep on. Okay, I heard you the first time. I'll do it. It was my excitement for you. You know, you were super excited. You were super I was excited because I've watched you do so much growth and healing work, and I thought, and that was almost exactly how I said it. I was like, "It's in your nervous system. It what's, is. what's left, Tim, is in your nervous system." Yes. It like you're good up here in your frontal lobe, and like your limbic system's pretty good. Like you got your, you're real grounded. You know how to like cope and like stay here when you need to and feel big when it's appropriate but i was like it's in your body yeah it is it and it was yeah it is and it was and so i i um i set up a i set up a, a time and i went up there and uh i won't name my therapist uh but she's amazing because she'll get inundated she will get bombarded <laughs> like you did it for tim do it for me and then yeah I, i'm not going to expose her because uh because a lot of people uh, listen to the pod and she knows them and oh. they'll be like oh this guy Tim Ross is amazing and because of confidentiality she's like oh I don't who's know that <laughs> y'all want to know the company line I can either confirm or deny anything that you've said or anybody who's ever contacted my office. that's exactly how that's going to go down I'm trying to tell everybody if you can't find don't a ask. friend <laughs> if you can't have a friend that that's safe pay for one okay <laughs> telling you so so I so I started going and I started digging around in there and, but it was at your behest. And so thank you. Oh. Cause I wouldn't have never known to take that next step into. Cause you had done a lot. I had done a lot of work. Yeah. I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one therapy, uh, did a lot of work around my trauma, 
but I had some stuff trapped in my body that was still informing yeah. me and, and, and still having me act out in some ways that I, I was bluntly, I was just tired of. Yeah. I was tired of like this, you know, this loop. So, yeah. uh, I appreciate you girl. Like it's, it's been amazing. All right. So, um, we can, we, we can go a lot of places. Um, but I want to, I want to start with what you have, uh, expertise in. Okay. I want to start with sex. Yeah. Okay. Because, um, it, I don't talk about it a lot. Bless you. Bless you. I mean, that sneeze. <laughs> Let me tell you something. That entire lung nasal passage. It's cleared when out I now. tell you it's clear, <laughs> that was one of the most robust sneezes. You know, you shouldn't hold in sneezes. I have no, no. You, you got to let them out because your heart's gonna stop anyway. Just don't let it stop for it. I know someone who blew out a vocal cord holding in a sneeze. Don't ever hold it, y'all. Let me sneeze body. next time. Y'all going to, look, the, the block going to hear it next time I sneeze. I, no, I'm not blowing no. a vocal cord trying to hold no sneeze. Your vocal cord's kind of your, your gig now. I think I need them. <laughs> I've always needed them. I think I need them a lot now, right? a lot now. <laughs> so, so, okay, so I want to talk about sex. I don't talk about it a lot on here, but when I talk about it, I talk about it. Like, yeah. I'm really, really blunt, right? And um, and you know what? I need to, I don't even think I'm being blunt, Jenna, honestly, it's just that most people don't talk about sex at all. I know. So when it, so even when you bring it up at all, people are like, oh, right? And they're thinking like it's mm -hmm. it's it's inappropriate. And we've it's, made it dangerous as a culture. We've made it dangerous. We've made a lot of things dangerous that aren't dangerous as a culture, but that's one of them. Okay, come on, come on, give me more, <laughs> give me more of that. We've made it dangerous. Well, we have. I mean. I, and I think there are people pushing back, and, and in some ways I think it's more reactive than responsive, meaning um, it's, a, it's an overreach to correct at times as well, so I'm just as concerned with that corrective action, but sex in and of itself is not dangerous. Yeah. It is powerful. Yeah, for sure. It can do harm. Correct. But in, in and of itself, it's not dangerous. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. So and so our body responds to that danger. Like if you if you start looking at some of these trauma experts who talk about like it being stored in the body yep. to piggyback on that, yep. like someone brings up sex and you just like brace. Yes. Because we've been taught with words, but more often than not without words, which those are the more powerful messages. Mm. The ones that are unspoken are mo always more powerful because we don't have any language to grab onto or explanation to grab onto as to why we feel that way. So unspoken messages are incredibly powerful and we have this huge unspoken message in our culture at large that sex is dangerous and so we just brace. Wow. All right. <laughs> All right, we gotta go slow. We gotta go real slow. When you talk, I, we have to go slow because um, if unspoken messages are more powerful than spoken messages, oh, yeah. then like that immediately made me think of so many people that I've heard grown, growing up that said, my parents never talked to us about sex. Yeah. And, and what I hear you saying is that's actually more dangerous. Oh yeah. When I've done, um, exploration with people about where their negative messages about sex or our bodies which overlap but are different Correct. categories and um or about vulnerability I, i'm going to be going super super Listen, slow you're going to have to chop it up yeah because like, i'm a nerd so much here i'm a nerd let me let me say this real quick before we jump in since we're going to sex yeah the biggest mistake you can make talking about sex is making it simple sex sexuality Humanity is complex, and we do more harm by oversimplifying it than to just let it breathe and let it be complex. Wow. So as I, like, hit these these facets, like, you're going to have to slow me down because I'm like, oh, but there's another one over here. And then there's another one over right, here. And right, it's right, the right, intersection right. of these 85 concept maps that happen as we're trying to sort this out. Amen. So <laughs> you, you just 
pause me back whatever whatever no i love do. it i love it all right so so to to i want to make sure i heard you correctly when you said that um your sex and your body yeah are two different things yeah like when i uh, i'm gonna use the word a clinical word when i assess for like what are the things from a mental health or emotional perspective that are getting in the way for somebody in their sexual experience it's not just the the activity of sex correct it is attachment our ability to relate and connect with others which has to do with vulnerability it is our message about our body correct so let me give you like a random because people never get as granular as it needs to be yep so let me give you an example of a body one you're taking a bath as a four-year-old and your grandmama you you take that washcloth and wipe your genitals and then you're like playing with it on your face and she goes oh no that's gross mm. so now you have this message about your body that ends up translating for some people into their sexual experience later so all the messages about your body which have to do with germ theory and shape and race and ethnicity and color and then function if you ever had a, like a medical or health issue like you you like undress and like meet someone for vulnerability with your body yeah. in the act of sex. So like just the body image, yeah, which is really true for men and women. That's yeah. not just a female issue. Yeah, for sure. So you have like a body piece and then you have like a power piece yeah, and then you have like gender role pieces and then you have other systemic dynamics. All of this is taken into play. So, so, um, a, 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 I just had a flashback <laughs> to high school yeah that I, I i probably haven't thought about this episode in tw how old am i 47 22 years maybe this is 32 years uh -huh. i'm 47 oh my god <laughs> And so, I look good. And this is what happens when we start to talk. Right, right, this right, right. right. exactly how it plays out. So oh, this is like 30, doing this. 32 years ago, we're at lunch. And uh, I, I won't name the names of these people. Um, but one of my friends is talking to this girl. And he's like straightening his pockets. And then he pulls at his crotch uh -huh. of his jeans. And he had on some baggy jeans. And she's like, oh, my God. I don't touch me with that hand. Uh huh. And he's like, "Well, these this part of my jeans <laughs> are oh. my pockets, and this part is the crotch, and I just kind of pulled right here." But she associated just him grabbing yeah. denim yep. in the middle as penis and dirty. Oh yeah. And now the hand is like. Oh yeah. Polluted with you know, this is that's crazy. And our world at large like makes money off of those negative messages. Mm. Uh, one of my new favorite, um, I guess, their product is uh, uh, Lume. Mm -hmm. Oh, deodorant. <laughs> Have y'all seen their ads? I yes. love them because they're like, guess what? Your vagina don't stink. It's your butt. Everybody's got butts. Not a women's problem. I mean, it's like a whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. they're like debunking, and one of one of their ads really dives into it and like gets into like the ads that were really alive and well in the fifties and sixties and about women's body and odor and all of these things that it is it is just so full of misinformation. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, so uh, there's this separation between sex and the body oh, yeah. and and people being okay with themselves. Um, first of all, with their bodies. Yeah. And then their sex and their sexuality. Yeah, yeah. And this is something that I had to, I had to piece together because I was, I was um, sexually abused over and over again yep. when I was eight years old. So, so to, to redeem my body yes, back from the trauma of being sexualized at eight yeah, to the point that I'm like, oh, I, I love my body uh -huh. right now as is, even though I'm trying to see my abs at some point this year, <laughs> but I love my body right now as is, and I love sex yeah. with my wife 
Yeah. And I love what we do and I love the way she makes me feel and vice versa and all this kind of stuff. It's like, that is so taboo. I know. Like, like it's been like heartbreaking for me for, for, for people to um, uh, take things that I have said about my sex and sexuality yeah. and draw conclusions about what's going on in my marriage bed. I know. And then be offended by it. Like we did a porn tape. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like my, my, my brain's like, what is going on? So, so how do, how do we help people? Yeah. How do we help people redeem? No, and I know, again, mine is kind of like a, that's a, that's a hard case, but I know a lot of, there's millions of people that have gone through sexual trauma, but, but even for the person that's just like, they were told when they were like you know, 12 years old, if you lose your virginity, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're going to wind up with gonorrhea. And it's like, oh, 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 dang. I know. That's frightening. And then I get married and then I'm like, I don't want to have sex because all I ever heard was it was brace. nasty. Yeah, yeah brace. You're, you're bracing we for go. it. Brace. Yeah. So how do we help people get past that? Um, It's funny. I, I assumed you were going to go here when I was thinking about today. I'm very excited about it. And um, have also, I don't know about abs, but I've been walking again. So I'm very excited about <laughs> investing in my own temple here and yeah. like, you know, going through that. Yeah. Um, and I do some of my best thinking when I walk. It's good. I don't know if that's because I'm like an eight and like a body type, but yep. like it's, it's just sort of my time. Mm -hmm. And so I actually thought, about, I've been thinking about that a lot. Some of that is because of some projects you know about that I'm working on yep. and hopefully going to launch here in the next couple of years and some of it's like the work that I do but I'll be honest with you Tim not because there's no answer yeah okay so please let me start with that because it's so complex I think the first thing that came up for me as I was thinking through that like what would we have to do mm. like, what would we really have to do I just know why people bow out I just like to offer some validation because it's so complex mm -hmm. Like if I'm working with someone individually and we're basically healing and detoxing from their experiences, the messages, mm -hmm. but then we got to get like a spouse on board mm. and that's real rough because this is not, I actually just, I guess I can't say reread because I listened to it the second time, but re-listened to Chuck DeGroat's book, mm -hmm. um, When Narcissism Comes to Church. Mm. It's a good one. Okay. Oh my gosh, I forgot how much I loved it. Yep. Um, but he talks about the healing process as a very long, arduous process that's full of like fits and spurts, basically. Mm -hmm. And so you finally have a person who's fed up and done mm -hmm. with this symptom or this challenge or this experience. So they start this process and then they realize it's, far more complex than they thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And I've listened to you talk about your investment in your own health and growth. I mean, yeah. it, it's no small thing. I, it's I really not, not. No, it's, it's really not, not minimizing it. No. And then you have to talk about getting like a spouse on board and they may have not been at that fed up point. And so now you have like the it's system really of the relationship. Yep. But then, and my husband and I, we chat about this all the time. You have very well-meaning leaders who are saying stuff about sex in large groups that they're sometimes doing more harm than good. And so you have a systemic issue. So you have this individual who's trying to get their spouse on board, but then they're sitting, I mean, I'll just pick on church. They're sitting in church and the pastor says something, and I know that pastor meant something well by that, but it's like, nope, that wasn't really trauma informed. And now we've got to undo this. So we have this like systemic issue, yep. right? Yep. And then you have the systemic issue of family. Yep. The people, you know, one of the, one of the examples that comes up all the time is like, well, why aren't y'all having kids? You know, the people mm. who get picked on for not mm. procreating fast enough. Mm -hmm. And then you have like the people who are saying this over here. And then you have Hollywood at large and you have yep. like the messages about how sex is supposed to work. And so this person is just getting inundated. So it is a very large scale issue. Yeah, it is. And, and I, and I would say it's, it's hard enough getting two people to be willing to do this work. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a clean answer. No, no, no. I don't, I didn't need one like that. That's really good. I, I'll, I'll never forget. So Juliet and I, we were married eight and a half years before we had our first child. Mm. That's, um, a, that's a nice time together. I didn't know that. Yeah, we had a very nice time together. We were being all the fruitfuls. 
Yeah. And we were doing no multiplication. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I like we that. were we were very fruitful. We was not multiplying nothing. Yeah. Okay. And um uh I'll never forget Juliet's go to answer. Five words. Every time somebody asked her, uh huh, year after year after year when we got married, because we didn't have babies for eight and a half years. Yeah, that's that's not common. Yeah, that's not common, right? You're ready for my you ready for my wife's five I words? I wanna know. I love Juliet. Stay out of my uterus. <laughs> yeah. That was literally her answer. Yeah. When are you guys having kids? But Juliet Stay out has, of my uterus. <laughs> Juliet has some boundaries. She does. Not all, and it's not just women, because men get sucked into that pressure too. Yep. Not everybody has that. Yeah. And it goes to a place of shame. And let me tell you something. Shame ain't doing nothing for your sex life, even nothing. if it's about your procreating. That's correct. Yeah, that's so very true. So you have that's all so this good. systemic stuff <gasps> that's just that's piling so liberating, on. liberating, Jenna. Yeah. Yay, I'm so glad you said that. It doesn't have to actually be just about the act of sex. It's like anything that touches any of those areas can potentially have an impact on your sexual experience. Absolutely. So you got to keep it complex. Well, well, and and you know, just to round out that whole conversation about us waiting to have our babies when we did start having babies um juliet's been pregnant five times we lost three kids Aww. um and so we're so grateful for the two that we have yeah um uh, but we have three in heaven and that can also be disruptive oh, massively you know what i mean to people's sex life is the loss of a child the loss of a promise the loss of an expectation fertility challenges yeah yes yeah so yes. um Okay, so also birth can be traumatic for both parties. Absolutely. And it's hard to then move back into sex as like fun, connecting. I mean, I've I've done EMDR. Yeah. For both the men and women. Yeah. That going through it or witnessing birth was so traumatic that like I had to heal from that before I could get back in the bedroom and have fun. Wow. That's not unusual. Well, no, no. So it, to assume that everybody thinks it's magical and natural and all that, like it is traumatic for some people. It it, it absolutely and and um I I was there, I was right over the doctor's shoulder for uh both of Juliet's mm -hmm. um births and and um yeah. It's intense. That's a that's a different movie. Yeah, yeah. That you're watching. <laughs> Now, 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 let me be clear. Um, uh, uh, I've always been like this. So I was, when Juliet would go have her yearlies, mm -hmm. I was there. Oh, okay. And I was right over the doctor's shoulder. When. What did they, that do for you? Um, I wanted to make sure they gave that back to me the same way it was before they went. It was fumbling. protective? It was very protective for me. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I just, I'm like, that's my vagina. Yeah. I just, I, what's going on down there? That's, you know what I mean? That's yeah. hers and mine, right? We are co-owners of this space and yeah. I love this space. And so I yeah. just want to make sure everything's all right down there. You know what I mean? So I was over the doctor's shoulder for her yearlies and I was over the doctor's sh shoulders when both babies came out. You've been having a medical experience for a while. Yeah. That wasn't shocking for you. No, it wasn't shocking for me at all. I cut all the right. umbilical cords for both of my kids. Yeah. Um, and um, it's, again, Juliet is my person. This mm -hmm. is me outside of me, right? Yeah. This is my, this is my, that's, that's me. So I care about me. I care about my body. You know what I mean? I care about um, my future. I care about my, my thoughts. I care about my dreams in this person, right? And so um, maybe people don't don't think about it that deeply. But when I talk about sex, I talk about it from a place of mm -hmm. I'm in love with me. Yeah. <laughs> Both sides of me. You know what I'm saying? And and the oneness of us and we and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I, I'm I'm very I'm I'm curious then. OK. I'm very curious then um, on how we get back to fun yeah. or, or not, not even how, how, how do we let's start with this let me ask this question first I'll ask it two two ways how do we have fun okay then how do we get back to it after there's been some type of trauma or whatever so I'll get real nerdy 
and um, and there's some argument discussion in the field of like mental health and psychology as far as this is concerned. But the school of thought that I subscribe to is that there are about eight or nine basic emotions. Okay. Okay. And all of the other variations of feeling words are just give us texture and color. And I love all of them. And they help us describe intensity and direction and kind of flavor it, Got if it. you will. But most people can boil them down to some basic emotion words and or emotions, which are embodied experiences. They are connected to our bodies. And those different embodied experiences do two things. Um, they signal that something is happening or about to happen. It's a God-given alarm system, yep. which is why shutting down your emotions is never the answer. Never. It's, it's, it's a dangerous thing for you to shut down your emotions. I understand why we do it in order to survive, but to stay there is not good. You need those. God gave those to us. So they're a signal. Yep. And then they give you energy to do something to resolve that experience, to either protect yourself or grieve or um, connect yep. or whatever. Most people are not using those correctly. Hmm. And I'm, I am hooking back around to your question. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Take your time. So m a large group of people would argue that there is only one positive emotion. And all of them fall within that. And that emotion is safe. The rest of them are all technically negative emotions. That doesn't mean that they are qualitatively bad, but they're, it's an alarm system. Your alarm system doesn't fire off when things are going great. Makes sense? It makes perfect sense, but, but... So happy is just super safe. Play is what happens when we feel safe. And it's where all of the positive emotions exist and we re-energize. All right. So if you ain't safe, you ain't having fun. I'm just saying. Also, your nervous system can't get aroused, but there's that. All right. <laughs> All right, this, this is, okay, I got to tell you why this is like a big deal. Yeah. Because one of our statements for the basement is that it's safe down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I like it. Uh, another one is it's safer in the basement. Mm -hmm. So you saying that, right? I had no idea that. Can I texture why the basement captures safety so well? Please. Continuing this conversation. Please, 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 like, please. Like let's please. nerd out. Please, 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 please. Because nerds rule the world. Yeah, yes we do. Um, <clears throat> so if it's an alarm system, and the only way you know you're the one positive emotion which is safe is because the others aren't firing off because the alarm system is quiet. It has no need to fire off. Hear me out. If you shut down your emotions, you can't feel safe either because the alarm system has to be on for you to know that it's working. Oh, my God. So you can't fake this, which is... I would also say one of the tenants that I hear out of the basement. It's like, it's not fake. It's not false. It's not a lie. You can't fake your way to safety. <laughs> you can keep talking. I just got to write this down. <laughs> Are you kidding me right now? You can't fake your way. You can't fake it. Like we can be fake about it, but truly in our bodies, like a, there's a word that, and, and you know my, I call her my work wife, my business partner and co-coach and all things. Kimberly and I talk about, I'm sure at some point we'll write a book on it, but um, congruence is, is a very important practice. And I would say it's a practice to practice congruence where the inside matches the outside. And so I think a lot of people talk and behave and act and falsify safety but for you to truly experience the best kind of arousal and the best kind of intimacy and connection, it has to be real. And in order for it to be real, you cannot have turned that alarm system off. I have to be capable of being angry at my husband to know that the anger doesn't need to fire off to know that I'm safe with him. Wow. And so 
it's why what I do with people can feel so counterintuitive because I'm inviting them to say no more, to get mad more, to feel their hurt more, to yeah. get in touch with their pain. They're like, I just don't like them even more. And I'm like, for now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Own uh, that for now. Yeah, own but that, But I'm honestly. siphoning that off. We're going to heal from that. And then we're going to keep the alarm system on. And then you're going to know when you're safe. And that's when you're going to... That's when you're going to know it's real. Which is why it's this long, arduous road of fits and spurts. There's no shortcut. All right. So, so, um, I, I, I mean, my brain is exploding right now. So two people about to have sex. Pause for the guy to put on a condom. Yes. And they think it is now safe sex. Yeah. And that, that was a terrible campaign. Can we just all <laughs> admit that? Practice uh, safe You're about to sex. just really take me on like a rant. <laughs> Please rant. I don't, like the whole abstinence, the previous abstinence only campaign that was like, really countrywide supported and in the crux of purity culture was so poorly done. Mm. Was so, it was not good sex ed, which I understand like the arguments against that. I don't agree with the potential solutions being thrown out yet. Understood. But it was fear mongering and incomplete information at best. For sure. Which does not work. That's exactly right. You don't teach someone how to swim with the sharks by being afraid of them. You teach them how to swim with the sharks. I was actually watching something the other day. Not that I, I have like this like fear, love, hate thing with the water. Like I want to go deep uh -huh. scuba diving. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I'm like, but there's creatures. <laughs> I'm like, oh. And I'm like mesmerized by it. But I'm like, but there's creatures. Right, but right. I was watching this like shark lady. And she's like, you know, if like a shark's ever swimming at you, you're just supposed to like punch down on its head. And I was like, Sounds so simple. Maybe I would have felt comfortable my whole life if I just was told, you just punched down on its head. I don't know. But like, that's what we need to be teaching kids. They should have all the information. We should not withhold information. We should not fear monger. They are going to make those choices because the only thing fear mongering does to your nervous system is make it brace. It's not functioning at its right. best. That's correct. That's correct. And you've withheld information. You've right. told them that safe sex is with a condom. Right. No, that's like, that's pregnancy prevention. Right. Wow. Which is not the worst thing that could happen with sex, by the way. That's also the other unspoken message underneath that campaign. We're, we're still undoing that one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Today. Absolutely. So. Wow, no, that, this is, uh, this is like super fascinating. So, so, so let me, let me go, uh, go further where my mind was going with this, w with the erroneous thought that a condom would equal safe sex. Uh, uh, it, it, based on what you were saying about the alarms that we have that, that can go off, people are literally, you know, you know, when a battery is going dead on the alarm in your house, yeah. it, it chirps every like two minutes. Oh yeah. I had one this weekend. Incessantly. You know what I mean? It's like, burp. that's probably a bad sound effect, but whatever, right? It's whatever it does. And I'm it's getting gonna, the giggles because I know y'all done sound effects on you. And so I'm flashing <laughs> back to that. <laughs> uh, we don't have that sound effect yet. So anyway. They might not like that in the room. <laughs> so so that 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 chirp sound is an indication that hey, there there's you need to do something. It's here. not gonna work right. It's not gonna work right, right? Well, I, I'm I'm just imagining people I'm imagining how many people have started to ignore the alarms. Like they're going off, oh, but they're yeah. just ignoring them. <clears throat> okay, let me let me alter it a little bit. Okay, it's not the chirp of your smoke alarm. It's it's the um. Let, let's really make it a house alarm. Okay, you open up the back window. Yep, goes boop boop boop. Zone mm -hmm. nine's open, mm -hmm. and then you close the window, and it's still going boop boop boop. Zone nine's open. So instead of figuring out what's what's wrong in the wiring so you can have an alarm system on, you just deactivate your alarm system. 
So now you're not going to know if the window's open or not. It was not working right. And now we can go back to trauma and the family you grew up in and a lack of boundaries and all the things that predates your relationship it is why it's going off when it shouldn't. But your answer to just deactivate your alarm system actually did not increase your safety at all. Lord have mercy. But it did turn down the temporary annoyance. But it might get you into more trouble later. Holy cow. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, 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 okay. So, so um, we are, okay. Oh, my and we're still talking about sex, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to make no, that known. No, no, like, that's absolutely. The thing. No, that, that's, that's <laughs> like, what's... This is, this is the I, crux of I'm it. I'm thinking about so many people. I wish I just knew. I wish I had what you just said in my head for like 22 counseling sessions I've had. Oh, yeah. Over the last like, you know, two decades. People hate it when I go back to the basics. I'm like, really? You're going to talk about the family I grew up in and my feelings? I'm like, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Because that's where it all starts. That's where it all starts. It's the foundation. Yeah. Family of origin. Yeah. Foo. Emotions. Okay. Okay. All right. So, all right. It, uh, I mean, you, you, <laughs> you're bringing up a lot, Jenna. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. <laughs> I am a disruptor. Uh, How you are, knew that can bring me on here. <laughs> when when there's certain there's certain people that hear this and they they just go oh this sounds daunting I'm never gonna have any fun that's in my exactly sex life. what I was saying yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I I can hold space for that all day long how do we get past that to a have, willingness yeah <clears throat> well so I do think that the pain is probably more widespread and more pervasive and uh de we were just talking about this the other day like mm -hmm. it, it'd be like if you had to demarinate meat correct right like that's how painstaking this feels yeah absolutely Not impossible, correct. right 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 but painstaking but i don't want people to feel it's not worth it right and part of what i tell them is you will not feel the same way on day one as you will on day 60, as you will on month six, as you will on year two, as Facts. you will on year five. And you know that personally. I know that personally. And so, but part of our problem as a culture, to go back to how we introduced ourselves at the beginning of this podcast, is there is no arrival point, but we have such an obsession with finish lines. Mm. So if we could break up with our obsession with the finish line, then maybe it wouldn't feel so daunting. Wow. I'm just constantly walking out and walking in too. And if we had that mindset, it wouldn't feel like I'm never there yet. <laughs> it's a real problem. We need to, we need to divorce ourselves from the finish line. Yeah. And, and I'm sure there's a whole lot of really complex concepts underneath that. Scarcity mentality, a need for affirmation from places that don't come from God, if I'm being honest. Yeah, for sure. Like if I am sustained and affirmed and validated by the very existence of my imperfect being because he loves me and I've received that, why do I need a finish line? I mean, like, you know what I'm saying? No. There's not going to be enough time on the other side of my finish line, so I need my finish line to be here in 12 months versus five years. That's a scarcity issue. Like, Yeah. Well, here's what's going through my mind right now. Like, I think we might even need to rethink the statement. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. I do agree with that, but tell me where you're going. In my mind, based on what you just said in this aspect – in my mind, I go, well, then don't even bring up the destination. Ah, uh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like orient yourself to a completely different thought. That way, the destination's never in your mind. Yeah. There's just certain things. I'm just supposed to be walking. Exactly. I'm supposed to be walking. I'm supposed to be living. And there's, I should be learning and growing and changing if I'm living. And if I'm doing period. all those things, I, at any given moment, I can pause and look back and go, look how far I've come. That's right. And that's the testimony. Yeah. Not that I finished. Yeah, absolutely. But that I walked. Yeah. 
that I journeyed. Yeah, I, I think I think I would move the destination because because people you say destination and, and people think destination is marriage, destination is master's degree. Let's be honest that that line is always moving. Th- that's what I was about to say. So so for me, based on what you just said, I would move the destination point wherever I thought I had it. I don't even know if you were to ask me if I knew where it was. But if I'm moving my destination point, I'm moving my destination point to death. That's when you're done. That I'll be done growing. Yeah. Actually, I won't be done growing. I will I will be growing. Until I die. Yeah. I will be learning until I, I die. die. Like we've read the the cheat book on this. Like we already know that that's true, but I, it's like we cannot receive that. Wow. Which puts us on a hamster wheel of never ending finish lines that actually perpetuates our dissatisfaction in life. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because we've been trained from the time, really from kindergarten, right? Like yeah. Prescott's going to graduate from kindergarten, yeah, which is crazy. That's so cute. That he's going to graduate from kindergarten. Like, not know. just be done with it so he can go to first grade. We're talking about dun, 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 dun. dun. We're, All kindergarten graduations are like we're, the cutest. We are cap and gowning five and six-year-olds. It's so great. This is crazy, right? So... So I'm like, I'm like, in my mind, I'm going, oh my goodness, we should be at an aging stage as adults. <laughs> we should, that's a robust engine. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we should be at an aging stage as adults where we can say, you know what? I'll be growing until I'm dead. I'll be learning until I'm dead. I'll be living until I'm not. And uh, as long as I am living, there is an opportunity for me to grow. There's an opportunity for me to learn. There's an opportunity for me to change. Yeah. That is that is now what is calibrating my life. Yeah. Which means I can learn this lesson today. I can learn it 10 days from now. I can learn it 10 months from now. Yeah. I can learn it 10 years from now. Yeah. It'd be good to learn it earlier, but if I don't, okay. I know. And the other thing that comes up, for me, is we have a lot of, I mean, I like some audaciousness. But, like, it's a lot, like, who has the audacity to decide that they understand where those thresholds should be and, like, how we're supposed to arrive? I mean, that part. you really start thinking about it, I'm like, who am I to yeah, decide? Very true. That's or very anybody true. else to put it on you that, like, that's this very is true. what, you should have met these things. And I'm like, I just, because I get, uh, so let's talk about another place that that shows up is um, I work with a lot of relationships and couples and marriages and they're like you're not the same person I married and I'm like praise God for that I mean that was 10 years ago that's correct like not want we should not want to be the same person so this idea that you could or the people who aren't getting married because they can't figure out like who and is it right enough and I'm like y'all you're acting like there's like enough assessments in the world to know yourself, know somebody else and know that that's going to match. Nobody has that getting married. That's exactly Nobody right. Has Nobody. That. Nobody. Nobody has that. Nobody. I, I, um, the, the statement I make to, I very rarely do premarital counseling anymore, but when I do the statement I make and I have historically made is, um, the only, this premarital counseling process is going to allow you to make an informed decision based on what you know now yeah, about this individual. But when you get down to that altar, you are saying I do to what you don't know. Yeah. That's what you're committing to. Yeah. What you know is what got you to put on that white dress, <laughs> okay, and what got you to put on that tux and that cummerbund, right, and get that little corsage pinned into your lapel. That's what got you down to this altar, but that I do, that exchange of vows, you are saying I do to what you don't know, not to what you do know. Mm-mm. What you do know is what made you get dressed up. Yeah. What you don't know, that's what you're saying that I do to. Yeah. So don't be shocked after 24 months when you're like, I didn't know this about you. 
you was never going to know until we got married. Let's be honest. If it was, <laughs> they didn't know That's either. That's exactly right. It's That's not exactly like they lied. Right. No. They weren't aware. That's exactly That's right. That's the developmental process. That's exactly right. Nobody I, can be aware. Nobody knows themselves no, good enough to be like, here's no. my resume for the rest of my That's, I mean, we just No. We can't do that. No. Which we is a control problem, by the way. That is a control problem. That's what it like boils down to. I need control. I'm like, well, you're not going to get that, but okay. Well, well, let, let me let me meddle just a little bit. I, I know a lot of people that are single right now because it is paralysis by analysis. Oh, totally. I found this wrong with them. I found that wrong with them. They picked up seven extra pounds. I didn't think they were going to do that. Uh, this person, I don't like the way th they got one tooth that's brown. Yeah, and it's it's just it's it's just throwing me off. I wonder what else is wrong with it. And you're like, what is happening right now? Well, and I I'm again, if I were given a case to work with that sounded like that, I would have been like, where did these messages come from that we need to detox from? Oh goodness, that I. Where didn't they come from? That's a better question. Yeah. <laughs> the like, better question is where didn't they where come from? Where did you from? get the message that that was what was important or that that was what you needed or, yeah, I just have, I have lots of questions. Yeah. I have more questions than answers. Yep. Okay. So, um, um, would it be hard for you to give us like three to five things that every married couple could do? I can give my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it has yeah, yeah. a has a professional flavor to it. Yeah, I want it. I want yeah. I want three to five things that every mar that every married couple can do to enjoy sex. Right now, today, like they could pause this pod and go and go find out. Like, they ain't gonna be easy. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying. Okay, they Where don't have to go? be easy either. They ain't gotta be easy either. Um, first, and I'm glad they're not easy, right? Because most people. Now, first of all, that'd be cheap. If you don't that, want easy answers. You want easy, cheaper sex. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. The, the, I don't. I you don't, want the good stuff. You got to work at it. That's exactly right. Good food takes longer to prepare. Yeah. First and foremost is to prioritize safety. It's great. Prioritize safety. You can't play if you're not safe. You want to play? You got to create safety. That is just. Yes. Period. Period. And what's safe for you may not be safe for your partner. Um, so we have to mutually agree. Yeah. I have couples do an exercise sometimes. <laughs> it's kind of like the adult version of red light, green light. Mm -hmm. um, but I have them do like, and I do use colors and all sorts of things sometimes, but um, I have them like create categories like green, yellow, and red. Mm -hmm. And I have them individually fill out like, these are all the activities, and I and I like to use that word activities because there are sexual activities. We've got a lot of wide variety of definitions out there. So these are just the sexual behaviors and activities that they're a green light for me. They bring up no hesitation for me. I, I do not, it doesn't bring anything up in my body. Now, I will say my big caveat with this is if, if there's a history of, of pain and hurt or trauma, some people are are not able to assess this for themselves. Understood. So this is not something that just everybody can pick up and do. Yeah, for sure. So if, if you're curious if you and or your loved one are capable of doing this, like go go work with at least for a session a professional. Yeah, for sure. And and get some some feedback because some people again, they've disconnected their alarm system, so just cuz the house is quiet, they think it's safe, but it's not. Right. So, um but if you're fairly grounded and aware to prioritize safety, like put all the like sexual activities and behaviors in the green category kind of on a list. And then yellow's like, maybe just a tiny bit of hesitation. I'm pausing. So I'm going to put them in the yellow. We'd like proceed with caution. Mm -hmm. And then red. Mm -hmm. And then you guys sit down. And I think you know this about me, Tim. But um, like I, I am, I'm almost militant when I teach my couples to communicate. Yep. So, obviously, my preference is that they would know how to talk to each other when they do this. But right, 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 right. We're just putting it out there. We're just putting it out there. <laughs> We're just putting it out there. Um, but then you share those. Yep. And anywhere where there is overlap in the green, play. Play, all, live in the green. I love Quit it. worrying about what's in the yellow and red and has come off the table, at least momentarily, until we figure out what's going on there. 
That's good. Live it up in the green. What overlaps in the green for you guys? Like play. Yes. You get to know, like we freely can move about the green and enjoy each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that's one way to find the shared safety. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are other things. Like you you need to be cultivating a context of safety. Yeah. So when I say prioritize safety, it's not just sexual behaviors and activities. It is the whole of the relationship. Yeah, for sure. And so if you did nothing but that, you'd have a better sex life. Wow. Because if you're safe, think about this. Think about the ripple effect. That's so true. If you're safe, we can negotiate differences. That's if exactly you're safe, right. That's exactly right. We can explore and play. That's exactly right. If you're safe, we can go through seasons where we're like, I don't know, my body's not working, like there's stuff going on, like, but we're safe. Like, yeah, exactly. You can navigate anything in, in the context of a safe relationship. That's exactly right. So it's it's just foundational to anything else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I love that. The second one is learn to communicate. Yep. Which I feel like is the conduit for building safety. So I don't know. Maybe they're the same. Yeah, no, no. No, I think there's a difference between establishing safety and then communication in that safety. And I've worked with professional communicators. Yeah. Uh Uh-oh. Who were terrible relational communicators. Terrible. Take your time, girl. Take your time. So just because you are good, clarity and connection are not the same thing. And the transaction that happens in business is not the same thing as the intimacy that needs to be happening in a relationship. So we're talking about a different type of communication. Wow. And if you are not using your feeling words, you are not connecting. Oh, you just exposed and helped a lot of relationships at the same time. Yeah, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, but we're on the same page. I'm like, yes, y'all run a well-oiled ship in your house. And not a single bit of that is connecting. Wow. Because like everything's just so smooth, everything's so easy, and I'm like, but you don't feel connected. I'm like, yes, and we can't figure it out. I'm like, yeah. do you ever use feeling words? Wow, with each other. With each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah or yeah. in general, but yeah, yeah, yeah. with each other. Yeah. Do you do you get into vulnerable stances? Mm. So, I mean, I I could go off on communication, but communication that is connecting and vulnerable. If you are always talking about somebody else and asking about somebody else and that somebody else might be the person that you love, you are not connecting because you only connect when you share about yourself and get into vulnerability. I know a lot of people who are like connecting personalities, like real, like relationally oriented, but they are always talking about everybody else. Like you sit down and have coffee and they are always talking about you. And I'm like, I don't know who you are. Mm. Which eventually, this is really interesting. I've worked with marriages that have one of those personalities in there. And I'm like, you know, that becomes a skew and a power dynamic eventually. If you know everything about them, but they don't know anything about you, you could look and sound loving. That's, that's power dynamic. Wow. Because you're not known. None of your stuff's on the table. Wow. So intimate, vulnerable communication. Of oneself to the other. Yeah. D- okay. So speaking of the alarm system... The negative emotion of loneliness tells you that you need connection yep. and gives you the energy to be known, not go get to know somebody else. And I know a lot of people who feel lonely and go have coffee and then talk about the other person the whole time. Wow. And they walk away going, I just spent time with all these people. And like, it didn't work. And I'm like, well, of course it didn't. You asked about their day. You asked how they were doing. You Y'all got together and watched a movie. Yeah, but you did for three hours, but didn't, we didn't talk. You didn't let yourself be known. That's what loneliness gives you the energy to do, to be known, which means it's got to be about you. That's not selfish. That's good. That's vulnerability. Okay, you ready for number three? Hit me. Because you know, I'm watching a movie right now in my head. So I'm going to speak to like the married couples who believe that like sex is supposed to be safe for marriage. Cause I realize there's a lot of people who don't. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'm speaking to the other couples too. As soon as sex is on the table, most couples stop doing everything else. <laughs> so, and, and by everything else, I mean 
sensual sexual activities that do not end up in playing with your genitals. So like once genitals are on the table, it's like everything has to lead to genitals and it becomes a problem. And it becomes a problem. To can, can we go slow? <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, what's your question? You're going to have to slow me down. No, no, no. The, the, so based on what you just said. Yeah. I am on good ground when I tell a couple that wants me to do their premarital, do not have sex until you get married. Because? Because the moment you have sex, now I'm not a therapist, so I'm just going to tell you the way I've said it. Yeah. And you can correct it if it's wrong. The moment you put that penis and vagina together, you will call a red flag hot pink. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I I am of the personal and professional belief. This is really complicated in the professional world, so I could unpack it if you want me to. But I think it's better to wait. Now, there are arguments about that, and there's a lot of, a lot of factors that influence it. And I don't know if this is the podcast for that. Because <laughs> it's like, it could be a seminar. <laughs> but, yes... I personally believe waiting is better. And I still have to work with the married couples that are like, we waited, da, 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 da. genitals are on the table, and now all we do is genitals. I still have to, like, undo that. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I just was talking from the standpoint of prior to marriage. It's better. It's better to wait because you don't get to establish points one and two that you just made. Yeah. You don't establish safety. I do think couples should kiss before they get married. Uh, I'm, I am down with that. There's actually some chemical exchange that happens that y- your body's actually... It's in that tongue, ain't it? It's in that tongue. Thank you, French. It's the Thank s- you, France. It's it, in that tongue. It's a spit swap. Yeah. And, and there is a chemical assessment know, that is happening. So I'm going to need that. There I'm going to need all cases, that spit. There are rare cases where couples did not kiss... And then lack for chemistry once they're married. So, like, I, I think, I think we're gonna we're gonna have a litmus test. Kissing's on the table. Yeah, for me. I'm, I'm I, kissing's on the table for me too. Yeah. Well, but I, I also I, don't I, have a problem with arousal because I think that's been taught poorly. But that again, that could be a whole other podcast. No, too. Well, well, see, I, I think that I, I think that um, uh, I, I have a I have a uh, friend of mine that I love to death who didn't kiss their uh, mate until the actual wedding day because they thought it was a part of the sexual act. And I'm thinking to myself, there was no way I was not going to tongue. I agree with that. Yeah. 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 I do too. I think, okay. So like, this is what, this is, this is where I went on my walk. Yeah. yeah. Well, (laughs) uh, but I, but like, I, I teach my couples to hold hands to rebuild their sex life. Yep. I also hold hands with my son. Yeah. But I'm a sexual being everywhere I go. Yeah. So everything I do is sexual. Yep. That is true. Yeah. Like I kind of think when, especially in church culture, if someone's like, oh, she's just being so, and I say she because this women who get picked on. Er, nobody's picking on a man and be like, he's being so sexy. How dare him? Like nobody does that. Mm. Um, but and there are <laughs> some being du- honest. And, and there are some dudes out here trying to be sexy. I mean, there's some pretty men out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> pretty, some pretty men. There's some pretty men. <laughs> uh, my husband being one of them. But I... Like when someone tries to diss a woman by saying she's being sexy, I just think it's funny these days. I'm like, yeah, well, we're all sexy because sexy literally means I'm being sexual and I am a sexual being. So I'm like, jokes on you. you know? Right, right, you know, exactly, like, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah. We're all sexy. So I'm like, well, I'm all sexy. Yeah. Um. I I think couples. I'm gonna go back. When genitals is fair play. There's this unspoken rule that everything has to lead to genital play. So here's how it plays out. Remember, guys, it's always more complex than we think it is. I've yet to meet a couple that have the same desire level. Mm. Okay? So there's always a higher drive partner and like a lower drive or desire partner, depending on how you want to say it. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing about that difference is the story that you tell yourself about it in your head. Mm. you will never 
as far as I understand, I don't think it's a good goal. Make yourself the same. The goal is not sameness. I actually try to get couples to embrace their differences. Yeah, I'm the higher drive one. I'm the lower drive one. This is how this works. You know, whatever. And that is really complicated. I mean, Kimberly and I were just talking about this the other day. Like, we got so many questions about female desire because it's been so stomped on. I don't even know if we have a fair assessment of it. But I do think there's different desire levels. And I... What happens is if all sexual activities have to, it's an unspoken rule, Mm -hmm, so it's a powerful one, mm -hmm. have to lead to genital play and release, Mm -hmm. then the lower drive partner, when they don't want to do that, what do they do? They start shutting down all the behaviors. Yes, absolutely. Well, I don't want to cuddle with you naked. Why? Right. Because then we're going to have to have sex. Right, 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 right. Well, and okay, that starts leading into some other belief systems like, well, if I get aroused, we have to do something with it. No, you don't. Right. Nothing falls off. You're not going to grow cancer. <laughs> you the might discoloration like, will leave. I mean, <laughs> right? Like, there's all, if you keep backing up the myths. Yeah, there's absolutely. There's reasons That's exactly why right. neither party will go there. So, you know, you know what couples start to do when they're, they don't both want it magically at the same time, which is pretty rare, by the way. Mm-hmm. They start shutting down connection activities. Wow. So couples practicing what I call non-demand sexual and sensual activities that are not allowed to lead to genital play is really a fascinating experiment that most couples, if there's no trauma that is unhealed, should try. Non non demand means it doesn't lead to sex. And I I say genital activity because sex is so again yeah absolutely poorly defined yeah that, that's absolutely correct no no that's I love that that is that is like t- talk about like a way to serve your person oh yeah. Right. And to love your person and to connect with your person and to bond with your both ways. Yeah. 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 Both ways. Absolutely. Both ways, because you have a lower drive partner who's like, I really want to connect and touch. And actually, since that is women in 80 percent of the statistics, she actually would really probably build up the oxytocin in her system and be more open to having sex later on if we did a whole lot more than that. Mm. Like, I cannot tell you how many higher drive partners, which, again, in 20%, which is statistically significant enough to be normal, it's it's flipped. Mm-hmm. The, the, the female has a higher desire. But I can't tell you how many husbands have said, I have gotten so much more of my wife practicing this other stuff. Oh, absolutely correct. But it was scarcity mentality that there wouldn't be enough sex that kept them from practicing it to begin with wow it's counterintuitive yeah no i'm okay 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 so i'm like shower naked together take a bath yeah watch a movie naked together cuddle all that and and like get of course you have to have communication so like get square like hey this is what this night is for like i'm not up for this but i'm up for this and like okay yeah sure (laughs) so so that no, I'm okay. So my brain it just makes it, it better. No, it does make it better. And thank you. Okay, so so so, I I have I, I get pictures for everything. Yeah. So so step one is to make sure we are safe. I see that as like, you know what? I want you to come in this room. Um, I'm closing the door. Yeah. Um. Uh, I check the alarm. Nothing's going off. Yeah. In me, nothing's going off in you. And the alarm system's on. And the alarm which, system's on. I didn't which, turn it off. Like, I didn't. Which can look like, hey, do you need to share anything with me? I want to know if I've tripped the alarm for you. I want to know your alarm system's on. That type of feedback in couples, knowing that that is safe and good. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we're both safe. We're both safe. Now we start talking. Yeah. And we're not talking about them. We're talking about us. Like I'm talking about myself, right? right? Yeah. I'm being vulnerable with you. Yeah. This is where I was afraid. This is where I was sad. This is where I was angry. This is where I felt misunderstood. This is, this is me. I want you to know 
me. This is why I feel like emotional affairs are so powerful. Yeah. Be- because because I've I, this this thought had I've not thought about this before right now. But these couples that only know genitals now. Yeah. Wind up in these emotional affairs where genitals have never yeah. been on the table, but they're known. Yep. So you got my penis. But I don't have your heart. They got my heart. You got my vagina. Yep. But yes, you've, you are now looking at six all, months worth of emails. Oh yeah. Well, all of that is, is about as rich as like technical virginity. Like I didn't technically have an affair. I, I do. I don't even call it a fair work anymore. I call it yo, yo, yo. Technical work. virginity is like, I'm fascinated. Oh, yeah. Because I didn't put a penis in the vagina. I'm technically a virgin. Like this, like I didn't technically have an affair because I didn't technically have sex with him. It's Correct. all these technicalities. I'm like. Yeah. Which, by the way, from a trauma-informed perspective, the one who got transgressed gets to decide what the transgression is. The I'm, one who, the offending party does not get to tell the wounded party how hurt to be. So I don't even call it a fair recovery anymore. I call it betrayal. I, I, I do betrayal work with couples. The betrayal could be an emotional affair. It could be pornography. It could be um, having sex with somebody else. It could be a whole lot of things. It's just betrayal recovery. Girl, which I'm, goes back to number one, which is prioritizing safety. Oh, that was so good. The one that got transgressed gets to define the transgression yeah when i do betrayal recovery work betrayal recovery like i borrow a lot from some different models out there and i was taught by some really brilliant people but one of the important parts that 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 we do at aspen house that i'm not sure everybody else does is after there's a confession letter then we have like a whole it's a whole thing yep 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 but after the confession the wounded party gets to name the cost in a letter. So you don't move from the transgressor doing the confession and then doing the amends because I don't think the one who transgressed knows what to make amends for until the wounded party names the cost of the pain. And it makes it a much more powerful process because like if it were between you and I, like who am I to tell you how much that should hurt? Absolutely. And what that cost you that I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would make no sense. Yeah. You have to tell me what my actions cost you. I yeah. don't trust this. I question this. Yep. And this is what's going. So you don't, that's why I'm like, I just call it betrayal and we, we let the wounded party. No, that's, that's. Kind of name the price. That's actually really profound and enriching because, um, uh, it empowers the person that has been transgressed yeah. to, if they do want to recover uh-huh. whatever is going to be moving forward, they, they need to be able to create the boundaries. Well, betrayal is a relational trauma. Yeah. So you have to move at it from a trauma-informed approach. Correct. Which means what trauma does is takes away power and voice and choice you have to give it back in the whole process you have to be giving it back it's a lot of notes i'm taking on this one (laughs) trauma takes away power voice and choice Mm -hmm. and it has to be given back wow come on autocorrect Oh, Jenna Mountain. This is where you start doing all your Captain Marvel stuff. Okay, so um, you gave us three. You yeah. gave us safety. You gave us communication. And you gave us this this wonderful experiment of non... Non-demand sexual and sensual activities. Non-demand sexual and sensual activity. Non-demand. Where, let me add this, arousal is not the goal, but if it shows up, great. I love that. Yeah. All right. Th- this is this is um, a little caveat uh, to this because you made a statement um, 
that blew my mind um, a few months back, and it was around the it was around arousal. Yeah, you said that um, arousal is not something arousal is not something we actually control. We just control the environment by you can, which yeah you can we, control the conditions we control the conditions of arousal but we don't actually control arousal yeah that one statement and and you said it in group and it wasn't like a big like f- focus thing it was like tim like you know what i mean you weren't <laughs> focused on me it was like you know it's our whole group there it's 10 people in our group plus our therapist and sometimes our other person yeah what is it? coach or I don't know co-coaches co-coaches okay so sometimes it's 12 of us but most times it's 11 and Jenna makes this statement like oh yeah you don't control arousal you just control the conditions by which you're aroused and I went oh my my, my." (laughs) yeah you do that in group a lot (laughs) literally I think little Timmy was like oh my god because here was my thought this is why sex education is so important yeah it's very very it's so important yeah because I was 40 Seven, like this is still within the calendar year. Me being forty-seven when you said those memes, like I was today years old. I was today years old. I was definitely (laughs) five five months old ago when I heard this, right? But here's the thing that happened when when you made that statement. My eight year old woke up. Yeah, he didn't know that. My eight year old woke up and was thought and thought. So I was abused at eight. By a teenage boy. Now, I'm prepubescent. So. But you start getting arousals in the womb. Thank you. Not arousals, erections, sorry. Okay, so now I'm now I'm today years old knowing that I, I had a boner yeah, in they've, my mom's they've womb. Got, That's, I mean, <laughs> that can't was prove, so juvenile. Can't that prove was, that. But like there's <laughs> there's like sonograms out there kind of showing some of that stuff and they're saying that. But like They're you, like, that's a start, definite boy. Yeah, you start getting erections because <laughs> erections are a blood flow thing. Yeah, absolutely. Early. Yeah, so okay, so even though you're prepubescent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd have erections. I, w- I was just saying that in terms of even though th- this is sexual abuse, this is not uh welcomed. Yeah. It's damn sure not warranted. No. Right? And um, completely out of my control with the age difference, the size difference uh, in our bodies. And it feels. That is one of the hardest concepts of good. childhood sexual abuse. You know what I'm saying? It yeah. feels. Or sexual assault, adult sexual assault. Yeah, it's both. Exactly. Okay. This feels good. Or a better word would be. I'm a, I was aroused by what was happening. Yeah, you, so I probably should retract a statement that I kind of flippantly said on the front end of the podcast, which is like, shame's, shame will squash arousal. It can. And if you press the right buttons on the body, arousal and orgasm at times can show up. Yeah, for sure. So those things happen inside of non-consensual sexual experiences, assault, rape. Uh, childhood sexual abuse and it does not mean that it was wanted that yeah. is that is rape culture yeah for sure that has taught that message absolutely um and so and so you have that and then you have poor sex education which teaches people not what to do with their arousal yeah so a- again sex education done well would really help a lot of people well i, I absolutely agree I, I think for me once i understood that the revelation of arousal yeah it's my way of saying it I, I i like i understood like okay so something aroused me at eight years old by a teenage boy that's that still arouses me married yeah to my wife yeah and if i want to be aroused in that way yeah by my wife it does not have to be connected no to that teenage boy (laughs) well and that's what trauma does yeah trauma makes you like question yourself and question connections and you you trauma keeps you confused and internally chaotic and emotionally dysregulated 
And all of that has gotten paired with something that was meant to be pleasurable and good. And so that's why, that's why doing the healing work is so valuable. Yeah. You don't have to grit your teeth through it yep. and try to figure this out. Um, well, so now I'm going to throw a grenade. Okay. I'm about to throw a grenade. I'm Can I say one thing real quick? Please say it. And I'm going to drink my water. Yeah, because there's a complexity the here. I've been trying to find the words for it because it's come up a couple times. But there is something not more valuable or worse because we don't do comparative suffering. Um, but there is something unique about healing a wound that was done in the developmental years of childhood mm-hmm. that has to be considered when we're talking about this conceptually. Correct. I because agree. we're talking about like you are grown Tim talking about little Timmy. We have to remember that you were eight trying to reconcile conceptually what happened. Correct. And, and there's just something very unique about that healing process because it happened when you were X, Y, Z years old and yes. didn't have language, yes. didn't have regulation, didn't have development. Yes. I mean, there's, there's so much uniqueness to it. So I just want to put that out there for the listeners. Absolutely. And, and what that additional addendum mm-hmm. is going to make my grenade even more explosive. Gotcha. Everybody out here in a same-sex relationship is not out here because they were born this way. I know thousands and millions are. But to your point, if you're eight years old and you get aroused by someone of the same sex before the adult in you Mm -hmm. can write a narrative and really cleanly separate what Mm -hmm. that is. Yeah. There's a whole lot of narratives that can be written to reinforce. Mm -hmm. Well, it happened. You got aroused by this person. You got aroused by a male and you're a male, then you need to continue to be with males. You got aroused by a female and you're a female, you need to continue to be aroused by females. So I just want to put that out there. I know that I'm inviting smoke and I'm opening up Pandora's box as a result, but I'm telling you, I was aroused sexually at eight years old by a teenage boy that doesn't make me homosexual or bisexual no or anything other than a sexual being whose body worked correctly yes sexually because it was exposed to sexual content aroused yeah i so we, I'll, I'll speak to it a little bit. Um, it's not my main area of expertise as a sex therapist. By the way, sex therapist is actually, it's a niche and then it's a huge umbrella. Correct. Um, but I did train a little bit under um, a gentleman whom I just adore and admire so much named Mark Yarhouse. And he is incredible. I would say read all of his stuff. Um, he's also, I think he's an Enneagram 5. Okay. Like, why did you whisper that? Because I'm like, <laughs> my starting a rumor. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he, he's like, he's one he, of the numbers. He for deep, sure. He deep dives. He he he. I, he just gives me five vibes. Let me put it that way. Got it. Okay, got like you. Five vibes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Just deep dives. So incredibly on topics and just brings a brilliance, but also is just a salt of the earth person. Like. I don't know if I've met anyone as compassionate as Mark Yarhouse. Like mm-hmm. I just listening to him teach and talk and like, I just could sit under his mentorship forever. I just really enjoy him. Um, but he, this is actually his expertise is in kind of um, the LGBTQ world and, mm-hmm. and does some incredible work. And I do trust him as an aca- academian mm-hmm. and a researcher mm-hmm. and, um, you know, my biggest concern about those conversations is how poorly they're being done. Absolutely. To your point. Yeah. And um, 
he would say, at least the last time that I heard him like lecture and teach, which wasn't too long ago, um, that there are a lot of people who will take research, which sidebar, that's like one of my biggest pet peeves inside of the church is like, we don't do a good job of understanding how to engage research. Mm. It's doing us no favors, mm. no favors. Mm -hmm. um, but he would say there are a lot of researchers that will present their findings as meaning something and it's a stretch mm. and he is a brilliant researcher mm -hmm. and you know last time i heard him kind of talk about the research that they're trying to doing on what causes someone to identify or experience their sexuality um it's he, he compared it to like if you pulled up like your your eye map on your phone and it was like all the streets were red mm -hmm. he's like it's a giant traffic jam mm. in the research mm -hmm. so from a scientific perspective we don't know good um and then to piggyback on what you're saying which has been one of my big pet peeves just in general if we understood if we taught our children to understand arousal I, I think there's still normal like developmental confusion that yep. would be appropriate yeah. as we develop sexually, which starts at birth, mm -hmm. by the way, um, that we'd have to navigate and they would ask questions about, but what gets inferred because they don't understand that arousal is not something we, it's an involuntary response. We can control the conditions and manipulate those to try to bring it about. I mean, that's that's what we do. Yeah, I was like, that's what my husband and I do when yeah, we yeah. want to have sex with each other. Yeah, for we sure. We manipulate the conditions to see if we can get that to wake up. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, but it can also show up non-consensually and in harmful ways that don't mean you wanted it. Right. Correct. And if if you flash something on the screen that's sexual content, whether it's within or outside of my sexual preferences, I might get aroused in my genitals because yep. like my body saw sexual content. Right. Correct. So the, I'm in just the ripple effect of understanding that correctly yeah. would change the lives of many people. Absolutely. Correct. Like men get erections upwards of every 20 minutes in like the peak of their development because there it's a system check and testosterone's pumping through their system. That's just what it does. Yeah. And, and I, I know of some men that because arousal was so par poorly taught and, and testosterone that like they're sitting in the middle of like middle school and they've got an erection and th they've been told it gets paired with like lust and a heart issue and all this stuff. So they look up from their math book to figure out whose fault this is, mm. which starts a whole spiral. And I'm like, but that's not, it was nobody's fault. Right. Exactly. But now I got to blame someone. Wow. I got to have shame. I wasn't wow. right. Was I thinking about, am I right? And like, we've been taught to pair the narrative this way and it's wreaked havoc. Wow. <sighs> and it's just a system check. It's blood flow, y'all. That's it. It is blood flow. It's not dangerous. It, it, it can get paired with those things, but it wasn't. And it's just a shame spiral effect. Because we don't know how our own bodies work. Jenna Mountain. <laughs> but do you see how much is there to be unpacked? Oh, my goodness. It's, it's, for it's a lot. For the communities at large. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. So when and, you and think that's about what, undoing this, it's like, yeah. holy smokes. Well, that, that's what I loved about you saying we're not going to simplify this. Mm-mm. We need to just leave it as complex as it is. I feel like there's several grenades that we're just throwing out here today. <laughs> we're lobbing. <laughs> we're just tossing grenades and triggering <laughs> triggering everybody and pissing everybody off, which I'm I'm here for, especially around this topic. Because if, if we can at least get people to think. If we can at least interrupt the bad cycle. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Yeah. It, it could be better. Yeah, I, 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 I think, um, man, I'm, I'm just thinking about how many. And uh, I want to. I'm going, I'm digging back into, um, a converse, our conversation, um, earlier. And I'm thinking about all of the pastors that, um, try to be experts at everything. 
Oh, I know. And the people that look to their pastor for everything, right? The pastor is not only going to give me, you know, a sermon from God's words, but he's also going to teach me what to do with my money and he's going to be my uh, financial advisor and he's going to be my relationship coach and he's going to be my this, that, and the other. And so um, that's a real weird um, place to put a pastor, especially around relationship, sex, and sexuality. And it's like, would you just please leave that to the experts? Right. Like I haven't tried to come on here and be like, I'm the sex expert or I'm the relational expert. I I just know what I know based on uh, the conversations that I have and all the kind of stuff. But then I refer people like I'm like, go see them because it ain't me. Yeah. You know, that's a very. Well, that goes back for me to the book I just re-listened to. Mm hmm. Um, Chuck DeGroat talks about all the time that churches are, it's not just that pastors have narcissistic tendencies. Like we like their narcissistic tendencies. We're attracted to them. We want them to be charismatic and grandiose and all these things. Bigger than life. Yeah. I mean, like, which means the church is a narcissistic system. Mm. I mean, so you can't just get onto the pastors. You got to get onto the system that wants them to do that too. It's, it's a cyclical. Correct. It's a cyclical issue. Yes, that's right. Um, but yes, I, so I, I've been kind of playing with some language, I don't know, to maybe develop some content or something to be helpful because you and I, yes, have talked about that a lot, specifically with, with the sex thing. Um, I think one of the biggest problems in the muddling of expertise within the church system in general, because it could be a Sunday school leader, it could be a group leader, like this happens a lot. It's not yep. just pastors. This is a lot of people. Yep. Is um, I think I love testimonies. I love them. And, and I think we all love them. I think we love to hear a story of healing and hope and triumph and joy and freedom. So that's not the problem. Yep. I think what has happened is we do not know the difference between telling our story and teaching our story from both a uh, giving and a consumer uh, place. So I would put just as much responsibility on the consumers as I would on the tellers of the story. Um, Because, so in keeping it complex, what worked for you and Juliet's not going to work for somebody else. It's good. But they would love to hear your story and they get motivated and right. they get inspired. Right. Yeah. And yeah, they yeah, receive yeah. it as prescriptive. Yeah, absolutely. And That's it very will true. not work for them. It's good. Or it might work for some. Yeah. But it's not going to work for a lot. It's and not cookie cutter. Yeah. And what happens in my office is people are like, well, I went home and I did exactly what the pastor said or I did exactly what the group leader said and it got worse. Mm. And so then they shame spiral. Because what does it mean about them? Right. If, I must be doing something If wrong. that formula didn't work for me. That's right. And so I want people to keep telling their stories. And I want people to still get inspired and motivated. But we're complex. Yeah, for sure. What works for one won't work for another. And we've got to, as consumers and tellers, keep it in the storytelling category. Yeah, that's really good. So that it's like, you know what? If we want to go home and like try that on, yeah. we can see if it works for us. Yeah, absolutely. Let's try that. Yeah, absolutely. And if it doesn't work for us, it doesn't mean we failed. Correct. It means that wasn't our thing. Yeah, that's really good. So I want I want everybody to keep talking about it. Yeah. I think that's the big stumbling block. So so um, we're going to wrap up here in just a minute, but I love you. The difference between storytelling and story teaching. Yeah. That's what you just did for us. Like like you gave us story teaching right it, it's universal principle that i work for anybody make sure you're make sure you're safe yeah as a person and persons within this relationship communicate and then non demanding yeah right experimentation and 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 yeah centralization around this connection that we're trying to have as opposed to you know my husband and i we have a date night every Thursday. And date night has X, Y, Z. Exactly. And-, and so you all should be going to the Cheesecake Factory every Thursday. And and then you're like, 
what? Like, we don't even like the Cheesecake yeah, Factory. We don't like that place. Right, we don't even like that place. So the formulaic stuff that's around the story, I'm glad your story is inspirational. How did you stay together 57 years? We took a walk around the pond every day at 8 a.m. Oh, good for y'all. And maybe you want to try that. Yeah, exactly. But that actually might not work for you. It, well, especially if you were a trust fund baby and you didn't have <laughs> to be at work at 8 a.m. Y'all taking a... 57 years y'all took a lap around the pond where do y'all live yeah also we that. owned an estate that's I 750 acres i do not have ponds to take laps around. <laughs> i have no ponds where i am from yeah no ponds i'm i might have gray poupon yeah uh, <laughs> but but that's not that's not the same pond. i'd like to see you take a lap around that. <laughs> Just saying. It'll be a very quick lap. <laughs> <laughs> Set that jar in the middle of the kitchen and just do a lap around it. Um, Jenna, thank you so much. Oh man, thank you. No, like like this, and you have to come back. Like I need you as a regular. Like after I talk to a bunch of crazy people, I just need Jenna <laughs> to come back and be like, Jenna, will you please? I would love to help you. me tell people talking that they're shop not with you is one of the easiest things to do. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate your heart and I appreciate your voice in this space. I appreciate you being a woman in this space. Thank you. I, I think um, that women need a woman's voice Yeah. Um, to, to be empowered, to feel empowered, to know that they have permission, yeah. you know, to create these boundaries and to um uh become strong you know what i mean and to your to your point like getting their power back getting their voice back getting their choice back they have to i see that in you like when i see you i see a powerful woman Thank you. who has her voice who has her choices and is using it for good i yeah. mean you, you started this company your i mean mental health is the 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 tsunami that is coming to this country right if it yeah. isn't already hit the hit the hit the uh the land and um to have uh someone like you at the forefront of it is i'm telling you it's a great blessing i appreciate so you. i love you i'm so proud of you i love you too. and thank you so much for being here and i can't wait to have you back anytime all right i love you guys have a great week peace yeah, I learned the game from Charles and Maxi. You can never tax me. Back to back for the pastor that didn't even ask me. Back to back like I am the brother with equal blessings. Back to back like I'm GE 9697. Whoa, I wanna see my dwellers really change. That's the reason for switching my freaking lane. Now I'm part and still saying Yeshua's name. Some of y'all hoping that Timmy will go away. It's two years later, homie, where y'all at? Sat up on my couch and made a B-side app. I'm not sure what it was that really made that happen. But this is what I gotta do, it really made God clap. I mean, whoa.